turn in your Bibles to Second Epistle to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians Chapter eight. Second <clears throat> Corinthians chapter eight. And we're going to read one verse. And um, trust the Lord that these meditations would be good to us. Second Corinthians chapter eight and reading verse nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Let's just ask the Lord for his help. Lord Jesus, we would ask as we would have these meditations before us this afternoon. May our meditations be sweet. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This verse <clears throat> is often read sometimes on a Lord's Day morning while we are in remembrance. We turn our thoughts towards the Lord Jesus and we think of all that he gave up all that he went through in order that we might have redemption, in order that we might have all the grace and privileges that we enjoy as the children of God. And we, it's okay to lift this verse and to use it that way as we meditate and think about what great work the Lord Jesus Christ has done and how we have been the beneficiaries of that work. I think it's interesting to let the verse go back into its context, back into where it is found, and to learn some very interesting things, some very wonderful things, and to see where this verse originated and the context in which it lies. Chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians is the chapters that Paul is writing to the brethren in Corinth and he is commending them and encouraging them to continue to do what they promised to do and that was to supply some resources to minister to the brethren up in Jerusalem. But it's quite interesting when you try to just imagine or to think through this setting, this condition. What happens in the life of the believer when we are encountering a crisis? What happens in the community of believers when there is difficulty because we live in a broken and a fallen world? In this text... It lives in the scene where up in Jerusalem, believers were suffering persecution, suffering desperately, and were in deep, dire need. And because they were in need, that was noised abroad throughout the whole community of faith, throughout the whole community of believers, and it stirred up something in the believers, both in Macedonia, a little northern place, a place north of Corinth, and it stirred up something in the Corinthians that they said, you know what, those are our brethren, we want to rise up to help. But it's also very important to understand a little bit, even go a little bit deeper to understand how amazing that is. The brethren up in Jerusalem were Jewish, Jewish converts. The Corinthians and the Macedonians were Gentiles. And if you understand the history of the Jew with the Gentile, it was not an amicable relationship. Jews, by their upbringing and by their cultural um, um, 
the rest of cultural culturalization, socialization, they had a distant relationship with Gentiles. And in fact, if you go through and you read through the New Testament, there are different occasions where we see that manifest itself. We see it manifested in John chapter 4 where it, she wasn't necessarily a total Gentile, but she was a Samaritan. She was a, what they call a hybrid. She was a mixed. She had some Jewish heritage and she had some, some Gentile heritage. And she was sitting at the well. She came to the well and Jesus goes to meet her at the well. And he, she says to him, what is it that you being a Jew are talking to me, a Samaritan? So this tension that existed between uh, the Jewish people and the Gentile people was a very real tension. And yet, what we read in this text is that when they heard that Jerusalem, made up of primarily of Jewish believers, were in deep need, their hearts were stirred and moved to help out. What brings about such transformation? What brings about such a change that completely upends this natural order of things in the world and in the culture? It's when those believers get a grip and get an understanding and respond to this truth of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context that this verse lives in. And so Paul is writing to them and he's encouraging them. The Corinthians promised to send money, send a gift up to Jerusalem to help out. But they sort of forgot it, sort of slipped their minds perhaps. And they did not follow through. And Paul is encouraging them to follow through. I wanted to point out one thing in verse 8 before we get to our text. In verse 8 he says, I speak not by commandment but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. You know, when we think about this uh, desire of the Corinthians to, to minister and to help out to the saints and the brethren up in Jerusalem, he says, you know, I don't want to make it as if I'm commanding you to do it. I want this to be an outflow of your love and forwardness of all the believers who recognize the need in their brethren and want to step in and step up in order to help. And this is consistent with grace. For grace does not necessarily enforce or try to impose its will. Grace is this offer that God brings to us. And He shows us the depth of our need and He shows us the depth of His favor. And because of the depth of His favor, the heart responds. And that's where Paul just interjects in the middle of his exhortation and his encouragement to the Corinthians to give, it, give the gift they promised. He says, for you know. For you know. You Corinthians, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had the privilege of bringing the gospel to Corinth. Paul lived and worked in Corinth for a little bit. And so when they heard of the good news, then they heard of the grace of the Lord Jesus, they responded to that gospel and were transformed and changed. In the first epistle, he tells us, such were some of you. The transformation in their lives as a result of the gospel, as a result of hearing about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was absolutely transformative. He says, such were some of you, but you are washed. You're sanctified. You are on a whole new level, a whole new ground because of your response to the gospel. And so he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. What did they know? They knew that they were characterized as a generation of people who did not know God. They were alienated from God. They didn't even have the promises of God like the Jewish brethren had and the Jewish heritage that they carried. They didn't have any of that. They were without God. They were without hope. They were lost in their pagan and their worldly sense where all that mattered was the pleasure 
that was sought after in the flesh. And yet, Paul would communicate to them and say, I want you to know about the sovereign God who dispatched his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord. And he uses his full title here in verse 9. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that this one who was ever existing in the presence of God, he was God's beloved son. He is the one who came into this world. He left the hymns, the, the hymn we often sing, and he left the splendors of heaven, knowing his destiny. He says, this Lord Jesus, the one who is the eternal son, he came into this world and he walked in this scene in such a way that God would recognize him. And we had the opportunity this morning to think along those lines as God would testify and open the heavens and say, this is my beloved son. This is the one who came into the world. And he would tell us when he came into the world that he, he he's Jehovah's servant. Behold, I, Jehovah's servant. He tells us that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to open blinded eyes, to heal those that are sick, to give, uh, to set those that kept free who are in captivity, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He came with a special message. He came with a special uh, desire. And he came and he touched lives from every corner of the globe that he moved. And every spot of the places that he moved, he did some wonderful things that glorified God. He says, this is the Lord Jesus. You know that this one, the Lord Jesus, left. He says, he who was rich. Now, you would think because the subject of the chapter is giving, and it's about resources, money that was going to be sent to Jerusalem to help, that when he uses this language that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, you would think that he's speaking monetarily. No, he's not speaking monetarily. He is speaking something far greater. And the riches of what the Lord Jesus Christ enjoys is something for us to think about. What were those, some of those riches? In Psalm 16, he talks about, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. What the Lord Jesus Christ, in his state of being rich, he, we read it, or it was quoted this morning while we were in remembrance. He says, he being in the form of God did not think it something to be grasped at. He was in, and is God overall blessed forever. There was nothing that he didn't possess and yet the riches that this would suggest is that he enjoyed what it meant to be deity without any encumbrances. Though being in the form of God, he didn't think it's something to grasp at. That's who he was in all of his glory. We, uh, I don't know if he sang to him, but the hymn came this, to my mind this morning. Christ's glory fills eternity. He was eternally in the very presentation of all that deity is. Ever enjoying the presence of God, the Father. Ever enjoying this relationship he had with the Holy Spirit. And then it says... That you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. What was that poverty? First of all, it's for your sakes. That why did Jesus Christ come? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ come? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ set aside this rich condition that he existed in for our sakes, for your sake? In that gospel message that Paul preached to the Corinthians, he reminded them that Jesus Christ came down to where you were in order that he might raise you up. And how low did he go? Philippians 2 kind of reminds us that he became a man. He took on humanity. That was one level of descent, you might say. He took on humanity to be limited, though for a time, to be limited by the constraints of what it was to be a human. To be dependent as a baby. 
Think about that. Christmas is around the corner and, and sometimes our minds turn to think about uh, the advent of the Lord Jesus. He took on to be dependent. Dependent upon Mary. Dependent upon Joseph. As he grew, he took on the conditions of humanity. He felt what it was to be hungry. He felt what it was to be sleepy. We know that occasion where he was asleep in the bow of the ship. And the disciples were anxious and concerned. Carest thou not that we perish? Little did they realize this one is in fact the one who can command the sea. They didn't know that at the time. And then he rises up and he says, peace. And everything was settled. But he took on the limitations of what it was to be human and yet without ever divesting himself of the deity and the dignity of who he was. But his poverty goes further in that he then would descend to be a servant or a slave. And he humbled himself even to death. And not just any death. The death of the cross. The cross is one of the cruelest ways that man can inflict capital punishment upon an individual. It is shameful. Uh, the Old Testament tells us that it's cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It was a horrific way to die. It was a horrific way to be on display before the watching world as he descended into this condition. And he says he did this for your sake. And in that descent, one of the things that we, and it was mentioned again this morning in Thanksgiving even with that descent, and even with all the suffering that man would inflict upon the Lord Jesus, with all the spitting, with all the beatings, with the crown of thorns, with the, uh, the pulling of his beard, the nailing him to a cross, it just reveals not that that was the means by which he would secure redemption, but it's the revelation of the depths of the heart of men. It would be the revelation of the depths of what the Corinthians were, were about when they pursued their own sin and their own desire. It would manifest itself and reveal itself that here a holy and righteous person would suffer under the hands of men who recognize that he did nothing wrong. And so there was none to stand up for him. There was no justice. There was no one to stand up and say, this is an innocent man, let him go. No, they rallied the cry and said, crucify him, away with him, we will not have him to reign over. That is the depth of the sin of the Corinthians. That is the depth of the sin of you and I. That is the depth of the sin of humanity, is that we can take what is righteous, what is holy, what is given by God, and reject it and cast it out and say, we will not have it. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came to this death for our sakes. He goes into death. And he would suffer death as a result of the conditions, or he would suffer deeply, personally, and physically on account of men and on account of wickedness. But then he would go even deeper to suffer to be made sin for us. To be able to be the one to take away our sin by the sacrifice of Himself. To remove that blight that stood between us and our Holy Creator. That's the depth that He left and joined Himself to for the sakes of the Corinthians. He says, because you know this, because you know this, is the depth to which the Lord Jesus Christ came and went to. He says, through that poverty, through that descent, through that humiliation that the Lord Jesus Christ endured, through His suffering at the hand of man and His suffering at the hand of God to show us our depth of our sin, to show us the holiness and the righteous demand of a holy God. This is the one, this is how He went for our sake. And he says the outcome of that, the result of that, the outcome of that work that the Lord Jesus Christ did 
is that now you and I and the Corinthians, who he's talking to, the Corinthians, you've been made rich. The Darby translation says enriched. He says, you have received so much. And one of the things that we learn about grace is grace isn't receiving anything that you deserve. Grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. It's God's abundant favor and his, 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 his lavish care that he pours out on those who are undeserving. And so, Paul says to the Corinthians, your response to the need in Jerusalem means that you've really contemplated and really understood and really captured the grace of the Lord Jesus. You really understood what he did in order that you might be enriched. And we know that this matter of being rich or this being enriched has little to do with money. Because if you read the context of these chapters, Paul says it's not according to how much a man has. It's about what's in his heart and his desire to do. It says they first gave themselves to the Lord. And Paul reminds them it's not about the quantity of what you're given. It's about the heart of the giver. It's about the heart that you have a compassion to show kindness and caring for those in need. Whether they deserve it or not. You know, sometimes we can, we do this for ourselves. We we, we, um, think about some condition or some situation and instead of simply responding and saying, Lord, what will you have me to do if I can be a help to that situation? We kind of go into our rational modes and say, I wonder how they got in that situation. I wonder if it's by their choices and decisions. They made bad choices. They made bad decisions. No, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your condition is. Because God's favor and His grace and the grace of the Lord Jesus came to you despite your condition. And as a result of these Corinthians meditating and considering these reality of the grace of the Lord Jesus, he says that's what opened their hearts. That's what opened their hearts to desire to do what was completely countercultural, what was completely uh, uncharacteristic of the days and the times. That they would have such a care and a compassion for those who were so different from them, culturally speaking. You see, when we get an understanding, when we comprehend, and when we meditate upon the grace of our Lord and and the grace of God, uh, here it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the whole subject of the grace of God is a, a tremendous subject in the New Testament. But as they meditated upon the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, it says that um, He, through His poverty, has made you rich. What is some of those riches that the Corinthians enjoyed? First of all, they would understand that now they were able to be instruments in the hand of God. Think about that. They were now able to be instruments in the hand of God to the ministry, to the needs of the Lord's people. That's riches. They were rich because they understood as a result of the work of Christ that though they had different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, that all of that dissipates because now they are one in Christ. Amen. They were one in Christ. When we comprehend the grace of God, you can't say anything to me and I can't say anything to you that says you are in a better condition with God because of this, this, and this that you've done. No, that would obviate, that would cancel grace. We were all desperate. We were all in need. We were all lost. We were all out of favor with God and God lavishes on us all of His favor and it's demonstrated in the way the Lord Jesus Christ was willing To become poor. They were rich because they understood and they saw the opportunity and they seized the opportunity to demonstrate what Jesus commanded when he said that then men will know that you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. That crossed those cultural and and, and, uh, ethnic boundaries 
that their hearts, their bowels of compassion yearned that they could do something to help their brethren up in Jerusalem. And so this matter of being rich wasn't about the amount of money they had or the amount of the gift that they were able to give. Look at verse verse 11 and verse 12. It says, Now therefore perform the doing of it. There was a readiness to will, so there may be performance also of that which you have. And if there be first a willing mind is accepted according to what a man has and not according to what he doesn't have. You see, it's not about the amount. It's about the willingness of the heart. That when your heart and my heart is touched by the grace of our Lord Jesus, when we consider how we've come into favor, not because of anything we have done, not because of our own righteousness, not because we are in a better situation when we started out. No, all of us have been recipients of this amazing grace. And when we understand that we have been recipients of the amazing grace, it transcends our thinking and changes and transforms our thinking as we relate to the larger community of believers. We overcome. We work. We are intentional to work through the things that come, sometimes just get in the way because of our different histories and our different backgrounds and our different ways of think, looking at things. But we overcome. Why? Because we've known the grace of God. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus. It's not according to what a man has. And Paul goes on to commend them and to encourage them to follow through on their desire to send help and ministry up to Jerusalem. Because in one of the phrase um, in this text, if you go back up to verse 6, You know, we could read verse 5. We mentioned verse 5, but he says, And this they did, speaking of the Macedonians, this they did not as we hoped, but they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Verse 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Look at the way Paul utilizes this understanding and this word of grace. He, he describes the gift. He describes the, 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 the collection that they were putting together to send up to Jerusalem. He describes it as a grace. He des describes it as the very thing that motivates and move them to give, he says, it's prepare this grace. Prepare this kindness. Prepare this activity, this, this collection, these resources that you can send up Jerusalem. And it is characterized, he calls it grace. You know, when you encounter a person who exudes this idea of grace, you are enriched because of it. How often we meet someone who just lifts us up and, and, and fortifies us and, and gives us something from the Word of God or, or, or just has a, a, a disposition about them as a result of their walk with the Lord and you walk away from them saying, man, I have been enriched by the fact that I've accompanied and spent time with Him. We can think of the, the two on the road to Emmaus, how they were enriched as they spent time with the Lord Jesus, as they walked those seven miles uh, to Emmaus and He expounded to them, He opened unto them the Scriptures and explained to them all all the things concerning himself from Moses and the prophets. And they would come to the realization, did not our hearts burn within us? They were enriched. They were, were fortified. They were amazed at what they had received because they were walking in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And he gave them some understanding and some truth that they had not grasped up to now. Up to then. And so when we consider the grace of the Lord Jesus, 
It opens up for us the opportunity to be gracious to others. And then he says in verse 7, you, you're abounding. You're doing all right. He says to the Corinthians, you're doing okay. You're, you're doing okay in terms of your, your faith. You know, you, you, you're holding fast to the things that were uh, taught to you by myself, by Timothy and other brothers who have come through and, and, and have instructed you. He says you've been abounding in the faith and you've been abounding in your words and that your faith and your words are, are, are consistent. He says you're abounding in that and he says, and in your knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us. They had a wonderful relationship, Paul and the Corinthians. Uh, and so they, 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 they would respond to the Apostle Paul's exhortation and encouragement. But he closes out, he says, you, you're doing good. You're doing well. And because you're doing well, I want you also to do well in this grace also. I want you to be givers. I want you to continue to give. I want you to follow through on your promise. I want the result of your meditation on the grace of the Lord Jesus to really fulfill and to really execute what you promised to do um, because of your love, your love for us, your love for the Lord, and your love for your brethren. So what are some of the practical applications of this lesson, this instruction from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9? When I know the grace of the Lord Jesus, I'm very hesitant, very hesitant to make it about me. Right? Because I have nothing. I brought nothing to the table. I brought nothing to the discussion. I am what I am, Paul says, by the grace of God. What else does it teach us? What other lesson, application we can make from this? The other application we can make for this is that I can see the needs and concerns of my brethren wherever they are, locally, across the the globe, across the pond, across the oceans, wherever they are, I can have compassion and caring and real sensitivity. Why? Because... The grace of God that has touched me is the same grace of God that touched them. And as a result, we are linked and united in such a way that what they feel, we feel. When they hurt, we hurt. When there's a concern there, we should be concerned. That there's this relationship that is ours because we have both been recipients of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. it would be helpful as we talk about the grace of the Lord Jesus who was rich yet for our sakes became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich there is also the analogous lesson with regards to how do we get to this point of letting this truth really open up our compassion and concern and care for our brethren And in Titus chapter 2, we have the fact that the grace of God, and it it transitions to the grace of God, not the grace of the Lord Jesus, the grace of God that brings with it salvation has appeared for all men. But it has another aspect to it. Not only does it bring salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works with any man should boast. But it says the grace now is our instructor. It's our teacher. It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and teaches us how to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. You see, grace is not just the fact that God lavishes favor on us and then leaves us to ourselves. No, He lavishes favor on us and He wants to take us and He wants to help us to progress. And in part of that progression, He helps us understand the unique relationship that we have with other believers everywhere. And out of those bowels of compassion, because our hearts have been touched by His grace, we want to minister grace to others. There's other verses that talk about this matter of grace. He says, let your words be with grace. Seasoned with salt, that it might minister grace to those that hear you. 
You see, when I am taken in with the understanding of how grace impacts me, then I want to do that in turn. And it's manifested not only in the desire to give, but it's also in the way that we talk to one another, the way that we minister to another, the way way we care for one another, the way that we look out for one another. It's all because of grace. May the Lord help us to meditate. And may our lives be really demonstrations of what grace produces in everything that we do. Wherever we are, under whatever conditions we find ourselves laboring, that we want to bring the element of grace because we have been the recipients of amazing grace.